Reading with your kids. Hola, Nihao, Kinichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Machaba, Mori Maliwanji, Namaste, Jumbo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you'll join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show. Tell your kids' teachers and the principal and the librarian. And also, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app. On Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher Radio, Ghana, Himalaya, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Anthony Kolink. Tony's returning to the show to celebrate book four in his Harwood mystery series. It's called The Merchant's Curse. Before we invite Tony back into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by the Lookbook Scavenger Hunt series, a totally interactive family activity by Barbara Tivitz. The Lookbook Scavenger Hunt book series is on a mission to make life and learning fun for the entire family. We think scavenger hunts are wonderful ways to increase retention and enhance problem-solving skills. Are you looking for ways to connect with your children? Slow down and look at the ordinary things around you in a new way. The Lookbook Scavenger Hunt is an open-ended activity that will spark conversations with your kids. Your kids can take the lead in learning as they hunt for objects hidden in plain sight. Share this experience together and build connections that will last a lifetime. We love this book, especially the the latest book, the Hometown Series. Check it out today, the Look Book Scavenger Hunt Series by Barbara Tibbetts. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Simple Words Decodable Chapter Books. From a very early age, Cheatham Knebo's son had a passion for books. Unfortunately, reading did not come naturally to him. In 2015, when he was six years old, he was diagnosed with dyslexia. With training, he soon began reading simple words and sentences. One night, he picked up Hop on Pop by Dr. Seuss. He read the entire 160 words over and over. Then he asked for a chapter book. Cheatham Google talked to experts, teachers, tutors, and pa- tutors and parents looking to find low-level, high-interest books. She knew others were in search of the same books, too. But they just didn't exist. So, since she was an engineer, she decided she would write for her son. And he began to read. And Project Simple Words was born. We believe the right book gives kids with dyslexia the opportunity to experience a love of reading and enjoy a chapter book without tears. Check it out today, simplewordsbooks.com. Join us right now from the beautiful state of Florida. Our guest is here returning to celebrate book number four in the Harwood Mystery Series. The new book is called The Merchant's Curse. Please welcome back to the show, Anthony Kolink. Hey, Tony, how are you? Jed, I'm doing very well, and I really appreciate you having me on the show again. I'm delighted to have you on these, uh, the, the Harwood Mysteries. It's a series of historical fiction for teenagers. Am I right about that? It is. Ages 10 and up, uh, but all, going all the way up through college and adults enjoy it too. But the sweet spot would be, you know, uh, later middle school and high school. So, uh, tell us about The Merchant's Curse. Yeah. So, The Merchant's Curse. As you said, it's book four in the Harwood Mysteries. It's a continuing story. So I guess I should probably first tell you uh, the first three books, uh, you know, Shadow in the Dark uh, was book one, and then The Haunted Cathedral and The Fire of Eden. They tell the story of a boy in 12th century England whose name is Zan, um, which is Alexander, uh, but shortened to Zan. And he winds up, uh, as you know from previous discussions, he winds up at a uh, Benedictine Abbey in 12th century England, and he is basically being raised by the monks. There's a girl uh, at the abbey uh, living in the nunnery who, you know, her dad dropped her off there while he went on some business. Her name is Lucy. So Zan and Lucy sort of are our two partners in crime. Uh, but in book two, 
the Haunted Cathedral, a new female uh, lead was introduced, and her name is Christina. Uh, Kazan and Lucy went to Lincoln, and uh, that's where Christina comes in. So book four takes place entirely in Lincoln, England, which um, was also the setting for most of book two. You know, you got Lincoln Castle and Lincoln Cathedral there, these beautiful historic buildings with some amazing histories behind them. And so book four, though, we really don't have Lucy in it. It's Zan and Christina as my, my two main characters. Wow. All right. I, you know, I'm I'm currently re-watching um, the HBO series Rome, and I, I kind of love those history. And, and I know that the, the HBO series, probably calling it a historical uh, series, is probably not too accurate. But it's fun to kind of imagine what life was like back in Rome or back in medieval England or even in the old West. It's, it seems like life was so much different than what we're experiencing today. Yeah. And it's the same thing with this series. It's, it's historical fiction, uh, but it's, you know, a little heavier on the fiction and lighter on the historical. So it's in a historical setting, uh, Loyola Press, who's my publisher, has done a lot to kind of really emphasize the historical aspects and put together curriculum guides and things that homeschoolers and teachers could use to supplement like a social studies curriculum, uh, because the books really do give you that sense of living as a peasant, especially in 12th century England, which is between the Second and Third Crusades under the reign of King Henry II right at the end of his reign, right before King Richard the Lionheart uh, comes in, and uh, and right before the Third Crusade spins up, which is uh, about to happen in a year or two after Book Four. Uh, but yeah, it gives it gives the readers, and especially the, the younger readers, uh, you know, the sense of, hey, this is what life might have been like living uh, if you were living, you know, in a, in a feudal system, um, in a monastic uh, you know, background where, you know, the Benedictine monks were so important to preserving Western civilization at this, you know, part in history. And uh, and some of the sort of royal intrigue that was going on with King Henry and his sons at the time, some rebellious sons who were, you know, basically giving him a hard time. So there's a lot of really cool things. But yeah, it's 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 giving the readers that sense. But I should emphasize that the books are very much written, though, with a very accessible vibe for young people. It's, it's, you know, I was sort of channeling a Harry Potter kind of a vibe when I was writing the series. So the series is very enjoyable, you know, suspenseful and spooky and adventurous, but at the same time has this kind of history and also some good religious themes in it. Yeah. Let's hit, let's hit on that. What are some of the religious themes that we're going to be um, reading when we read this book with our kids? Yeah, so uh, so the series itself is sort of a coming-of-age vocation series. What does God want me to do with my life? And that's definitely a theme that goes on with the main characters, uh, you know, throughout all four books. But then each book kind of does its own special theme. Uh, like book one is really about suffering and, and why do bad things happen to good people. Book two is about forgiveness versus hatred. Book three is about pride versus humility. So now in book four, The Merchant's Curse, it's about vanity. And I really used the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes as my inspiration for the kind of religious themes. There's a lot of Ecclesiastes that is in between the lines and in the mouths of some of the characters. And Zan is even doing a, uh, you know, he's reading Ecclesiastes as, as his assignment from his uh, mentor, brother, or father, Andrew, now he's been uh, ordained. And so the book really kind of explores this idea of all the vanities of this world that will not save us, that will not bring us ultimate happiness. And different characters are sort of struggling with different, you know, vanities of the world, whether it's fame, fortune, beauty, or in Zan's case, he's trying to be like King Solomon. He He wants to be wise. And so he's pursuing wisdom. But as you might remember from Ecclesiastes, uh, you know, we're told by the author that even the pursuit of wisdom is like chasing after wind. And so Zan kind of uh, learns that uh, as he's going through also. I talk about vanity. I think this is a really important time for that. Living in this age of 
social media where it seems that the most important thing in in some people's minds is to be famous and to get the likes and to get the get that viral video out there um i think there's a lot of a lot of great discussion can happen around this topic there really is and uh, and like I said, I sort of designed it so each of the different characters were sort of struggling with a different vanity. So like Zan's, um, you know, Christina is the main girl and Christina is a little bit different than Lucy. Lucy's a very sort of holy kind of um, spiritual girl. Christina, she's a good person. She's, you know, she's not an unholy person, but she's much more worldly and she's beautiful and she's very much focused on you know, how she looks uh, and because her parents want her to marry a rich man and she's trying to, um, you know, find a, a rich husband, um, even though she kind of has a, a flame for, for Zan and he kind of has a crush on her too. Uh, but there's other character, Nigel, who's the one that she's sort of thinking might become her husband. He's totally wrapped up in power and, and um, you know, he's the one who is, uh, you know, friends with uh, or, or trying to get into the inner circle of one of King Henry's sons who's rebellious. And so he leads them into this whole idea of potentially being traitors to the king. Um, and he relies on like these friends in high places, but, you know, we see that maybe some of his hopes are misplaced. Uh, some of the other characters are struggling with power. They, you know, very, uh, there's like a menacing bad guy who kind of is power hungry. And then uh, the, the uncle's, business partner who actually gets cursed by this witchy woman uh that the name of the book is the merchant's curse based on this uh this witchy woman who curses the business partner he sort of is uh the you know wine women and song kind of a guy you know really handsome happy go lucky and he's lived a very sort of flighty life before he got cursed by this witchy woman and and so those are the different, you know, and those are the same things that we're struggling with today. Like you said, you know, whether it's especially our teenagers are so focused on everything has to be how do I look? And, you know, when I go on social media and they all want to get high powered jobs and make a lot of money and be famous and be around celebrities. It's kind of the same things that we're struggling with today. Sure, sure. And, excuse me. And talking about People who were just after power, I mean, just look at, unfortunately, look at uh, almost any of our politicians, and it seems that that's, no one seems to be interested in really solving problems. It's just, what can I do to maintain my power or to even get even more of it? And um, it, it can be very discouraging at times, but I think it's an important time to to have conversations about these kind of values and 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 how we want to live our lives absolutely and and you know in that sense things haven't changed very much since the middle ages i mean king henry the second had several sons um richard the lionheart becomes king king john becomes king that's the king john of the magna carta in 1215 um but he's had he has other sons too and almost all of them were rebellious and wanted to eventually, you know, take the power to themselves and, you know, were willing to sacrifice family and, you know, align themselves with enemies like France. Um, that's sort of the, uh, the subplot, you know, the new king of France is, is plotting with one of King Henry's other sons. Um, so yeah, this, things haven't changed. People, you know, they wanted power. They wanted, you know, an easy life. They wanted to, you know, be famous and beautiful. Um, you know, human nature has been the same. And, and, and even in the Old Testament, you know, King Solomon or the author of Ecclesiastes, you know, shows us that, you know, all those things are like chasing after wind at the end of the day, because, you know, who knows when you're going to get cursed by a witchy woman and, and potentially lose your life, uh, you know, uh, when you didn't expect it to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or as my mother used to say, who knows when you're going to get hit by a bus? That's the uh, modern equivalent of being cursed by a middle evil, a medieval witch. <laughs> hey, you know, you used the word earlier on in our conversation, vocation. And when I was growing up and when I was at uh, Jesuit high school, we would obviously hear that word a lot. But it was always in when it was used, it was always this idea that, oh, maybe I have a vocation to become a priest. 
that's not the only kind of way that we should be thinking about vocation, right? Exactly. I mean, I really use it in its probably its broadest sense uh, as a coming of age theme, you know, trying to figure out what to do with your life. But as as it turns out in books one, two and three, Zan really does contemplate, you know, becoming a monk. And he has to decide at the end of book three, am I going to stay at the Abbey and become a monk like Father Andrew wants me to do? Or am I going to go to Lincoln and live with my uncle and become a merchant's apprentice? And in that case, his vocation would be probably to the married life. Uh, but uh, and and Lucy, same thing. She's more attracted to becoming a, a religious, a nun. And uh, Christina very much wants to, uh, you know, be in the married state. And so, you know, uh, I'm I'm using it in a broader sense. But yeah, one of the monks, like I said, Brother Andrew, becomes a priest in Book Three, and uh, it, that's a you know a good background for book three because that's where a lot of decisions are being made by the other characters but that's the one where brother andrew actually gets ordained and so that's sort of the setting um it's a jewel actually book three fire of eden is a jewel uh you know robbery you know mystery where zan has to figure out who stole the jewel but you know the jewel is stolen on the eve of brother andrew's ordination so there's a lot about vocation to the priesthood in that one um but you're right. I mean, kids nowadays, very few of them are going to choose a, or, or even maybe have a vocation to become a brother or a nun or a priest. But uh, they they very well probably have a vocation to married life or single life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and I think it's real important for for all kids to understand that there's many ways to serve. Definitely. And and that is actually one of the themes that comes out, because as the characters are kind of struggling, well, what should I do with my life? You realize any of these paths and Sister Regina uh, is sort of the, the nun mentor, uh, especially in books one, two and three. But she has some great lines in books three when Zan is like, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I'd like to stay here and be a monk. Do I really want to go and become a merchant's apprentice where I just and looking for, you know, becoming worldly and making money. And, you know, she kind of tells him, you know, what matters is that you make God the center of your life. And, you know, any of these paths, if it's the path that you're supposed to take, are, are good paths. You know, you have, you know, all these wonderful choices. What's important is to keep God as your, the way she says it, you know, the I am of your life. And and that's sort of one of the themes in book three. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm again. I, I'm fascinated by by history and imagining what it was like living at that time. I, do you have a process when you're researching the, these various times? Um, do you do you visit the, the the area? Do you dive deep into books? Uh, what? How, how do you go about your research? The the world building for this I did mostly several years ago when I was working with book one. Um, not only did I go to England and, you know, actually travel around on a, a, a boondoggle to uh, do my little research tour of the different places I was writing and went to Lincoln and went into the cathedral, although it's it's a different cathedral now. Uh, only one of the walls is still present from the one that's in this book, uh, in these books. But, um, you know, I traveled around. I consulted with an expert at Catholic University. Dr. Jennifer Paxton, it, her specialty was 12th century English monastic life. So she was a perfect person. And she worked with me a lot on book one to get the world building down. And then once I had the world building down, uh, you know, and, and, and if you look inside any of the books, there's a beautiful uh, illustration that Loyola's put together. Um, I'll show you on the Zoom, but your mm -hmm. listeners won't hear it. But it's Zan's world, really. It's the world building that I've done. But once that's been done, then it's like doing deep dives into specific issues. So in book two, Lincoln Cathedral is, you know, the main, hist you know, the historical event that goes on in book two has centers around the cathedral. And there are like entire histories that were written about the cathedral because it went through a lot over the years. Um, in book four, you know, the major historical event is about King Henry's sons and the rebellions that were going on. So I did a lot of research about that. But 
I had already established all of my world building in mostly books one and two, so I'm able to to sort of key off of that now in the later books. Mm-hmm. That's that's really one. I I think I think that these books are just there's so much. I mean, if you were to choose to to gift the, the entire set to your kids for Christmas, I think you could be engaged in conversations all the way through summer. Absolutely. And I, I highly encourage you to gift the entire uh, series to, uh, you know, kids, grandkids, nieces and nephews. You know, so many times that, you know, adults are like, what am I going to buy a teenager these days? Do I buy them another Amazon gift card? Do I buy them, you know, another video game? Well, this series, uh, you know, I wrote it so that it could be the kind of gift you'd want to give because the kids will enjoy it because the books really are actually quite uh, spooky. They're quite suspenseful. There's a lot of adventure in them. And anything that's religious is sort of organic to the, you know, setting and, and the plot. Um, so, you know, the kids really like it. I, I haven't met a kid who didn't, you know, enjoy it, even if they weren't a particularly religious kid. They appreciate, well, that's just sort of the setting. And so, you know, it's part of that life. Um, but then the, the, you know, the adults are like, well, this is great because not only are they learning some history, but there really are some really great family Christian values that are, are also, you know, in the background of this. And it shows how the characters are, you know, trying to make decisions based on, you know, kind of a, a Christian worldview and, you know, what that looks like. So I really uh, hope that this is the kind of thing that you give to, uh, you know, kids for Christmas. Yeah, absolutely. Now, is book four it, or are we going to have book five, six, seven, 15? Eh, I don't know about 15, but book five is already at Loyola being edited. Hopefully that'll come out in 2023. Uh, book six is outlined, and we're about to sign the contract on that. Um, so it's at least going to go to six. Um, honestly, I've been building up to the third crusade. Uh, at the end of uh, book five, we're going to see the major historical event is Saladin, uh, the sultan in the Holy Land, takes Jerusalem back for uh, Islam. And the Christians, you know, basically, uh, you know, lose Jerusalem and, and most of the kingdom of Jerusalem uh, in 1187 which then triggers the Third Crusade, which really starts in like 1189, and that's where Richard the Lionheart comes in. So if I get to write a book 7, 8, and 9, it, I'm, I always envision that to be sort of a Third Crusade trilogy where Zan and the other characters are actually in the Holy Land, uh, you know, during that crusade. But all these other books have sort of been leading up to that. There's a lot of kind of hints that this is coming and that things are going badly for the Christians in the Holy Land. Um, but books one through six are all uh, essentially taking place in in England. Uh, book six, I think I'm going to get him finally traveling towards the Holy Land, at least. Awesome. Well, where can people go to find out more about the Harvard Cru- Crusade, C- Harvard Mysteries? I'm sorry. Sure. Well, um, of course, my website, AntonyColank.com, uh, has links to n- not just this series, but a lot of other things. Uh, I actually have a separate website called The Harwood Mysteries, and it's not hardwood. It's H-A-R-W-O-O-D. Uh, a lot of times people think it's it's hard, but it's hardwood. Uh, it's that easy. Um, so the harwoodmysteries.com. Of course, Loyola Press, uh, you can go to their website and, and you'll find it there. Uh, and if they just want to buy it on Amazon or barnesandnoble.com, Christian book, it's all there. But I would always encourage you to, you know, go to your local bookstore, your indie bookstore, your Catholic bookstore, and ask them to get it for you. And that way you get to support your mom and pop bookstore in the area too. Absolutely. Been a great time speaking with the author of The Merchant's Curse. It's book number four in the Harwood Mysteries. Our guest has been Anthony Kolink. Tony, thanks so much for being back with us. Thank you, Jed, and I hope to see you again soon. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We have a a special episode that's going to be a a, a great interest to any author or aspiring author that may be listening. And we know that there are lots of authors who listen to the show. We know there are lots of aspiring authors who listen to the show. Lydia Lukitas will be back with us. She's going to be talking to us about the business of writing, especially how to get an agent. 
That's something lots of folks, I, I just had a conversation with an aspiring author not too long ago about this very subject. So you definitely want to check it out. Lydia Lukitis, how to get an agent, the business of writing. That's the next episode of the podcast. Hey, and, 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 and if you are an author, please be sure to check out readingwithyourkids.com and click on the Authors Click Here button at the top of the page. Scroll on down to find out how you can be a guest here on the podcast. Find out how you can submit your book to our Certified Great Read panel and find out how you can take part in our monthly promotion program and have your book celebrated through commercials here on the podcast, through messages to our 100,000 plus social media followers, and have your book displayed on our nationwide network of digital pedestrian billboards. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to start by thanking our guest, Anthony Kolink. Be sure to check out Tony's new book, The Merchant's Curse, book four in the Harwood Mystery Series. I also want to thank our sponsors, Barbara Tibbetts, the author of the Lookbook Scavenger Hunt series. Fantastic, totally interactive fun for the whole family. I also want to thank the folks at Simple Words Decodable Chapter Book, simplewordsbooks.com. If you have a kid who is uh, struggling with dyslexia, you absolutely want to check out this website. They have a great, great selection of, of really interesting books for kids struggling with dyslexia. I also want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Mirabella Q, Jordan Saley, Stephanie Davila, Skylar Strauss. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of The Reading With Your Kids Podcast.